And the last time I spoke, we left off in verse 15, which is kind of kind of a bummer I had to leave off there because it, we're really keeping in this train of thought that, you know, as believers, we don't owe the flesh anything. We picked that up from verse 12, that we're not debtors to the flesh. We don't have to go on presenting ourselves to the flesh. That, that automatic domination of the sin nature in your life has been broken through your identification with Christ and his death, his burial and resurrection. And so there's nothing that we owe to the flesh. We're not debtors to the flesh. And as we said, it was, it's not like, you know, Vinny's going to appear uh, around the corner in a dark alley and take something from us. We don't owe the flesh anything. And part of the reason we don't owe the flesh anything uh, as we began to look at the last time, was because we're heirs. And Paul uses these, these terms, adopted and sons. And if we're not, if we're not careful enough, we're just going to blow right past that. And we're just going to say, oh, sons, that's just, that means part of the family. And we're going to say, oh, adopted. That means that we weren't part of the family. We were adopted into the family. And if you recall last time we spoke, that wasn't the Roman, uh, Greco-Roman concept of adoption. It, there's something significant in this passage that Paul is trying to communicate, and we'll kind of kind of continue looking at that this morning as we jump into verse 16. But what we're going to see as we move into the glorification section of this book, these first eight chapters, once, once we hit verse 18, we're moving out of sanctification, we're moving on to glorification. But what we're going to see is that we've got three entities that are moaning and groaning. Moaning and groaning for the believer's glorification. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning is really that first um, entity, if you will, that's, that's said to be moaning and groaning, looking forward to waiting for the, for the believer, you, to be glorified, to be completely delivered from the presence of sin on that day. And so let's jump into verse 16. And to just kind of pick up our flow of thought, I'm going to read from verse 14. He says this, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And then verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so we see that we've got a star witness, if you will, somebody that's testifying. Um, And in this case, it's the Spirit of God indwelling the believer who is ongoing, continually um, testifying or witnessing with our own human spirit. This is an ongoing ministry, I believe, of assurance, because what is he trying to convince our spirit of? That we're children of God. Verses, look back in verse 15, we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. And do you know that many Christians around the world who are truly saved don't have the assurance of their salvation, that they think that there's something they can do or something they don't do where they can lose their salvation. They're not, they're not 100% sure they're saved. And so they live on a daily basis in fear of possibly committing some sin that would condemn them to hell or to commit some sin so habitually that proves out that they were never saved. And many people live in fear. And you know, the Spirit of God is indwelling you today. He has an ongoing ministry. He is bearing witness with you. Those of you who have put your faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work alone, the Spirit of God wants to convince you of the certainty that you are part of God's family. This is an ongoing, present ministry that He's engaged in. The Spirit of God testifies with their spirit. You'll notice the, the, the verb tense there. We are right now presently children of God. Not one day we hope to be. Not one day, oh, I hope I can get to heaven. If I don't commit the unpardonable sin, and people say that to me all the time, hey, I, yeah, but if you commit the unpardonable sin, you, you're going to go to hell. And I say, well, what is the unpardonable sin? They say, I don't know, but you don't want to do it. <laughs> you know, and imagine living in fear. Like that, that you're going to do something that would condemn you to hell. Here's the good news about the gospel. This is, this is what I love about our God, because Jesus Christ died for all of your sins. All of them. Can we say all? That means all of them. In fact, how many sins did you commit uh, when Jesus had died? You hadn't committed any. And that means all the sins that you'll ever commit were in the future 
When Jesus paid the penalty for them 2,000 years ago, this is why God can unequivocally say in the past tense, you have been saved. You have eternal life. Eternal life, by definition, lasts forever. And so if you have something that lasts forever, you can never lose it. And see, Paul is telling us the Spirit of God is indwelling us. He's testifying with our spirit. There's this internal ministry to convince us that we are the children of God. I liked how one commentator put it. He said, the Holy Spirit provides a consciousness of being born of God. The Spirit of God wants you to enjoy the fact that you are a child, not by works, but by grace. Of course you don't deserve it. (laughs) That's the very definition of grace. Of course you didn't earn it. That's the very definition of a gift. And so the Spirit of God is trying to convince you of that, but I want you to notice something. It's very subtle. Again, if we don't take the time to to really point this out, we may just jump right over it. But I want you to notice that Paul switches terminology here. Uh, He was just talking about, in verse 14, being a son of God. It's the Greek word huios. And now in this verse, verse 16, he switches to technon, children. You notice that that switch. You You can even see it in English. He goes from sons to children. Why is that significant? Well, the word technon means to bring forth, to bear children, a child, descendants, or an offspring. And and what it speaks of is biological birth, okay? And so um, I've got five kids over here that I could say they're my technon. They were born, well, I guess Carrie could say that even. They were born out of her, but I I contributed a part. So uh, they were born of me too, but, but they're my technon. They're my biological children. Whereas sons, uh, the emphasis there, remember, is again on inheritance, okay? And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the distinction, but remember, children, uh, this technon, are identified by our family relationship through birth, whereas sons, or huia, stresses our legal standing through adoption, okay? And we'll, again, when we get to verse 17, I'm gonna, we're going to bring this out a little bit more, but just kind of hold on. He's ma- he is making a subtle distinction here. It's very important to the understanding of the text. So the question becomes in verse 16, how does the Spirit bear witness? How does the Spirit of God bear witness with our spirit that we're born again or that we're born into the family of God? Notice I'm not saying we're adopted into the family of God. I think that's incorrect. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. We're born into the family of God. Second Peter tells us that we have the divine, we have the divine nature. Access to the divine nature means we've got so to speak, spiritual DNA running through our blood. That's who we are. We're part of the family of God. We were born into the family of God just like you were born into your family. And so how does the Spirit bear witness? How does he have this ongoing ministry? Well, I think, first of all, he does though through the ministry, the instruction of the Word of God. This is why if you as a believer are not placing yourself under the instruction of the Word of God uh, in a teaching situation, you're not listening to teaching, you're not going to benefit from this ministry. There's not much to work with there. But when you read the Word of God and you hear somebody teach the Word of God and you study the Word of God, the Spirit of God is going to take that truth and minister it to your soul. And he's going to say, see, you are secure. See? See what he just said? See what he just said? All means all. Eternal means eternal. See that? See that? And the Spirit of God is elbowing you (laughs) internally to convince you and to comfort you and to give you that security so that you don't have this spirit of fear, but you've got this confident spirit. In fact, we see in John 1, 12 that we, are, we become children of God when we receive Jesus Christ. And then the verse goes on to tell us, how do you receive Christ? By believing in his name. That, 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 that word faith again, right? 160 times in the New Testament alone is the only thing you need to do to be saved. The only thing you need to do to be born into the family. Also, 2 Timothy 1.12, very familiar passage. Uh, we used to, to sing the song in the church that I grew up in. I don't even know if it's in the hymn books, but I know whom I have believed, believed. You know, they needed that extra syllable to make the, I know whom I have believed and, I, and I'm persuaded that he is able. You know, isn't that an interesting wording, seeing how, pa- how passionate Paul is about the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's not, I know, it wasn't, I know the formula that I, that I prayed. It wasn't, I, I know the day I walked the aisle. It wasn't the, the day I raised my hand and asked Jesus to come. No, I know whom. I, see, remember what he said in Romans 7? 
Who will deliver me from the... See, see, Paul's life was wrapped up in a person, not in a, not in a religion. And, and it's not, you're not knowing your church attendance. You're not knowing your good works. You're, you're not confident in, the, in how many candles you've lit. You know that there's a man named Jesus Christ. He's the savior of the world. He died for your sins. He rose again. God accepted his sacrifice on your behalf so that you don't have to face the death penalty. And he gives, credits his righteousness to you. In fact, he is our righteousness, so it never goes away. That's why you know. That's why you can be assured. Because you're looking outside of yourself. As I've said a million times, I can't even remember to take out the trash on a weekly basis, let alone remember all the things that would be required of me to be righteous in God's standing. But you know what? There was one who did everything right. There was one who did everything perfect. There was one who sacrificed himself and willingly took my death upon himself, and his name is Jesus Christ. And do you know whom you've trusted in this morning? Do you know the full accomplishment of what he did for you on the cross. See, the spirit of God is nudging you. You can trust him. You can trust him. You've got security. It's all okay. You've been not given the spirit of fear, but the spirit of adoption as sons. How else does the spirit testify or bear witness with our spirit? Well, I think he he does through his indwelling ministry. Again, he's constantly drawing our attention upward. Look back at verse 15. The spirit of God Uh, the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. This continual drawing your attention upward. Daddy, intimacy, not not this faraway God that doesn't hear you, but this this ministry of the spirit that wants to convince you that you have access to the God of the universe. You you remember that, some of you remember from the history books, but John F. Kennedy, uh, the president, And does anyone remember the picture of John F. Kennedy? He's sitting at his desk. He's in a meeting with somebody. And there's a picture on the underside of his desk. And and little John F. Kennedy Jr. sitting down there playing with his toys. And and they used to tell stories about how uh, JFK would would lock the door to the Oval Office. He'd have a a meeting with somebody, a a very important dignitary. And yet he was, they were the the Secret Service men. Uh, I don't think Rob Armstrong was working then. It was much later. But the Secret Service men that were outside of the door were told if, if Junior comes up, let him in. He had access. Why do you have access? Because that's his daddy. And, you know, daddy could be sitting across from the head of state and he would reach into his drawer and pull out little Junior's toys and put him right underneath them. Isn't that, a, isn't that a beautiful picture of access? This is what the Spirit of God is continually elbowing you. Look, man, that's your daddy up there. You don't have to run away from him. You don't have to feel like he's distant from you. I mean, have we made mistakes? Do we make mistakes? Oh, I'm the only one in the room. I, no, I mean, obviously we do. But you know, the, the confidence that we can have is that Jesus has paid it all. Your access has been paid for. Your standing is secure. And the Spirit of God is convincing you of this on an ongoing, present basis. And so we see that's another way that he testifies with our spirit. And then I think just as, a, as kind of an observation, I think the, the fact that there's a battle within you, uh, between the sin nature and the Holy Spirit is a witness that you are one of his children. Otherwise, there wouldn't be much of a battle. Uh, but there's a battle going on, raging inside of you, and you can relate to the comments that Paul makes in Romans chapter 7. The things that I want to do, I can't do, and the things I can't do, those are the, the things I don't want to do, those are the very things I do. And you, you sense and can feel that battle. Now, Paul... Paul concludes this kind of section here. Really interesting. We've got to go slow because in verse 17, he says, if children, and and if children, then heirs. Now, let me just stop there. That phrase is loaded (laughs) with meaning. We we cannot jump by this phrase and say, oh yeah, well, children, heirs, sure, that that, that all goes together. Um, No, it doesn't. (laughs) This This was an astounding comment in Paul's day. This was not ho-hum, yeah, I already know this. This was an astounding comment. We'll talk about that in a second. Not only heirs, but heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Um, 
So according to Paul, the only qualification needed to be an heir with Christ is to be one of God's children. Did you pick that up? That's, that's subtle, but that, that means this. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you're an heir. Now, do we understand how different this is from Paul's culture that he was writing to? Remember the, the concept of adoption, um, and I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself, but that's okay. The concept of adoption, I can't wait to get this out again. The concept of adoption was you didn't adopt somebody else's child, biological child, into your family. Roman Greco or Greco-Roman adoption was you adopted a biological child in your family. That was the concept of adoption. And so, and it was done over a period of time. It was done when the child got old enough and the father would watch his son and say, ooh, man, this guy's not making good decisions and he's going to wreck the family wealth. But this son over here, wow, he's impressive. He's mature. He's taking this serious. And then at a point in time, he would determine, I'm going to go through the adoption ceremony with this son and I'm going to confer upon him the, the full inheritance. He's going to become my heir. Galatians 4 tells us that before that happened, he's just like a slave in the house. I mean, he's got, in fact, not only that, he's got a slave over him, taking, running him to school and, and ordering his affairs in the day. And in a moment in time, immediately after the adoption ceremony, he's the boss. This son is now the heir. But it, see, it was, it was almost like a probation period. The dad's like watching his kids. You know, he's got eight kids. And he's like, oh, I'm going to pick that one right there. That's going to be the one I adopt and make an heir. And see, here's the beautiful thing about this. God doesn't have you on a probation period. God has not said, well, let me watch how you live the Christian life for the first 20 years, and then I'll make you an heir. He's saying the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are an heir. The moment you become a born child of God, you are an heir. This is why in Ephesians... When we look at Ephesians 1.5, and I'll just read it because I'm flipping right back there. He says, having predestined us to adoption as sons, there's our Greek word huios, by Jesus Christ to himself. See, this is why God has predetermined not to justify you. That's not a justification passage at all. That's a glorification passage. He's determined that anyone who puts their faith in Christ will be adopted, will be an heir. And this is what Paul is trying to convince us of here. In fact, if you're born into the family of God via faith in Jesus Christ, you are a joint heir with the son of God's love, period, period. That's true of you, whether you realize it or not. You are a joint heir. And this is one of the things the spirit of God is wanting to convince you of, wanting to bear witness with your spirit about. Remember, an heir is just a person who benefits from an inheritance. And one of the things that you realize about an inheritance is that it's, it's an unmerited distribution of wealth or possessions. Now, those of you who have inherited anything know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe, maybe you, you lost a parent. Maybe you lost a, we're all looking for that rich uncle, right? That rich uncle that leaves us millions of dollars. But the point is, is you, you did nothing to earn that inheritance. You know, one of, the, one of these days, both my mother and father are going to pass away and um, I'm looking forward to that, that wealth pot that they're going to leave me. Um, no, just kidding. I say that as a joke because my dad's here. But um, no, but, but you know, the, the, the only thing I contributed to that wealth pot growing up was making it smaller. Because I ate them out of house and home. I needed shoes. I needed clothes. I, I needed lots of thingies, you know, as you need when you're growing up. You need lots of thingies. Uh, I didn't take the best care of the cars that they got me. You know, I mean, I, I, I drained that little wealth pot. I didn't contribute to it. So if there is anything left for me, guaranteed it's unmerited. I didn't, I didn't deserve it. He did all the work. He earned it. It's his money. And so when we see this idea of inheritance, this is something that's unmerited. This is, of course, you don't deserve it. That's the, by definition, that's the word. You don't deserve it as an heir. Uh, and typically, an inheritance is something that an heir receives or has distributed to them when the successor dies. Again, in Roman culture, naturally birthed sons, technon, were not always heirs. Sometimes they were if they were officially adopted as sons. And so you see what Paul's doing. He's, he's subtly saying, guys, 
You don't have to present yourself to the flesh. You don't owe the flesh anything because you're an heir. You, you got it all. You're, you're not on probation. You're in such a, uh, an incredible position. You couldn't be in a better position. Even if God wanted to put you in a better, he's already put you in the top spot. This is what he's trying to convince us and his readers of. Again, this is not the case in God's family. We, we see because of Christ's performance, we don't have to perform to inherit. We, we get the inheritance because we're joint heirs with Christ. And then we, we come to this next phrase. Is it a little confusing, depending on how you read it, um, in verse 17? Because he says this, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And he throws in this if word, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified uh, together. Now, one of the things that we have to understand, any, anytime you, you look at the Bible and you see the word if, understand, you may not know what they are, but understand that the Greek has four conditional clauses, and it's all borne out right there in the language. It's really easy to see and to show. Um, but the first class condition, which is used a lot, especially in this chapter, I think, I feel like I've mentioned this uh, a ton here in chapter 8, but he says, if indeed we suffer with him, and for argument's sake, let's assume we will suffer with him. It's a, it's a, way, it's a way to frame an argument to assume the reality of something. Um, by the way, have you ever suffered as a believer? Okay. I mean, it's, this is what he's, so he's using this as a literary device to say, if you suffer and you will or you are, it, you know, it's, it's a reality that he's assuming um, and so what does he mean by that? He's not saying you'll be an heir if and if only if you suffer with Christ. That's not what he's saying. In fact, it, it's a way to uh, promote assurance here. And so what he's trying to do is convince us of the certainty of our inheritance. Let's look and see how he does that. Um, first, we want to notice all of these connection words used here. Just in verse 17, you know, to describe our union with Christ, we're joint heirs. We suffer with him. We're glorified together. All of these Greek words use the prefix son, which just means with. It's, it, it, it really speaks of our unity and our union with Jesus Christ. And, and, and what he's going to do is he's going to use these words and he's going to use this conditional statement to convince us of the fact that just as real as your suffering is, is going to be just as real as your inheritance and your glorification. So if you've ever felt suffering and it's felt real and it's felt heavy, here's his promise. You will one day have an inheritance that's just as real. You will one day be glorified in just a, a, a real as a way as you're feeling suffering. Now, isn't that encouraging? See, he's promoting certainty here. He's not trying to promote Ooh, I don't know. Well, some of y'all might not be here. That's not the whole passage. He's been telling us you're heirs. You've received the adoption. I mean, he's not trying to promote uncertainty. He's trying to promote certainty here. So our inheritance, our future glorification is just as guaranteed as the suffering that we experience with him on this earth. And he wants us to understand that. So when we suffer with Christ... Again, this is, a, this is a divine perspective. You know, when you're going through suffering, let's be honest. The first thought is generally, Lord, get me out of this. Lord, don't, why'd you give this to me? You know, there's a lot of, I don't want it. Like, just get me out of here. Take these circumstances, improve these circumstances. But we, we ought to understand that when we suffer with Christ, hopefully it, it draws our focus upward and reminds us and encourages us to know that these sufferings that we're going through that are very real, we don't need anyone to convince us that suffering's real. We know it is through experience. But at that time, just remember, your future glorification, your future inheritance is just as real, just as real. And he wants to convince us of that. Now, he's going to continue this thought as we move to verse 18. He's going to transition into glorification um, in verse 18, and just as a quick review of the book of Romans, and I, I mean quick because I got to move. We have been through, um, and that is way too small. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should have ex exploded that a little bit. Anyways, uh, chapter 1, 1 through 17, introductory comments. Uh, and then we looked at chapter 1, 18 through 320. And we, remember the, the highway to hell illustration. There are three lanes on that broad road 
uh, to hell. So we've had the immoral sinner, the moral sinner, and then the religious sinner. And then the conclusion was all have sinned. Nobody is good enough or righteous enough to go to heaven. And so how does God provide a righteousness equal to his to get to heaven? Well, that's when we enter into Romans chapter 3 toward the end. And we begin to look at this one salvation with three separate time elements to it. We call it three tenses of salvation. And uh, the, the first one, the past tense, is justification. We covered that from uh, Romans 3.21. In Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law has been revealed and it's through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we see that all the way to the, uh, to the end of chapter 4, the first 11 verses in chapter 5. We looked at the benefits of justification. And then the, the latter part of chapter 5, we looked at the identification of the believer. And you say, well, why was that there? Well, that was the, the, the means and the process that God went through to provide for your second phase of your salvation and to sh- secure your final phase of salvation. And when we say second phase of salvation, we're talking about sanctification. Uh, where justification dealt with salvation from the penalty of sin Sanctification deals with the salvation from the power of sin in our daily life. And so we've been looking at that up through Romans 8, 17. And so we're about to cross over into uh, glory land. We're about to cross over into glory land, glorification, uh, starting in 8, 18 through the end of this chapter. And so we'll see kind of the emphasis going uh, really toward this, these concepts of, of hope and future and what's going to happen. And so we begin to see that. Uh, broken down in verse 18. So let's read verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And and you see, he kind of continues that suffering theme from verse 17. He kind of starts to to bring that over. And, And he wants you to know that he's considered something. This is that accounting term that we see a lot in Romans, logizomai, uh, in fact, we see that a lot in Romans 4. It, it comes out quite a, quite a bit. But the idea is to, to write something down, to count on something. Like when you, when you deposit a check into your account, you write it down so you know it's there. It, you're trusting in it. You're counting on something. And so Paul is considering something. And what is he considering? Well, when he compares our present sufferings to our future glory, he says they're not comparable. They're... And that is, I mean, this is, this is the truth for the eye of faith. Because many of us say, oh, that's a bunch of garbage. I, suffering stinks. Suffering hurts. You, some are saying, John, you don't know how difficult it is some days just to get out of bed, just to, to go to sleep because I'm so anxious. And all I can tell you is that the word of God's got great hope for you. It, it doesn't compare. The, the greatness of our glorification far outweighs any suffering that we're going through. And I know that is a hard word, especially for those of us going through suffering right now. But be encouraged. The Word of God says there's something much weightier waiting for you. Worthy, this word worthy means way, uh, estimate, value. It was re- used to refer to a set of scales where the weights are completely equal uh, on each side. And so in essence, our future glorification outweighs, is going to outweigh our future, our present suffering. And so you'll notice that in this section, a lot of times, Paul's going to fast forward us to the future with truth that's going to happen in hopes that it'll impact the way that we presently Live and, and, you know, if you and I can get to a point where we begin to focus and understand that our present sufferings are not worthy, don't, are not weighted the same as our future glory, do you think we could, we could have a, a more divine perspective on life, and trials, and suffering? I mean, it would naturally follow. Um, in fact, not only that, it, it would detach us in, in many ways from this life and make us anxious to get there a little bit quicker right? We've actually got something to look forward to. It's not dreading, just trying to get through the day. I, I remember Carrie and I used to, to joke, mainly I used to joke and she would listen, but I, I used to joke, you know, when the kids were little, it was like, you know, bunker mentality. It just felt like all day long with the little kids, we were just dodging bullets and finally they all crashed at eight o'clock and, and I crashed at eight fifteen. you know? I mean, it was like just survival. 
And you know, sometimes life feels that way, doesn't it? I mean, just bullets flying around your, your head, ducking like you're in a, a, a foxhole sometimes. And so um, understand that the Word of God says there's something much weightier waiting for you out there in the future. Take heart, be encouraged. That's going to be true of you, believer. And then he, he says this. It's an interesting statement. Um, we'll kind of unpackage this a little bit more in the next couple of verses. But notice in verse 18, he says the glory is about to be revealed in us. You know, you see that? In us. That's something to just kind of mark in your thinking there. Because we're going to kind of see what that means. But, but understand that, that this is talking about our glorified bodies. And please understand this, that you as a believer, you are, present tense, in Christ. And then you say, yeah, what's so deep about that? I already know that. You are right now a child of God. You are right now righteous before the God of the universe. And you know, one day when, when this body is shed, it's, that's going to be revealed. We're going to see you for who you are, not because you merited it, not because you earned it, not because you fasted 18 times a month, not, not because of who Jesus Christ is and the position that he puts you in. And one day we're going to see it and I'm going to be blown away. I'm going to look in a mirror and say, that can't be me. I, you know, I'm a scumbag. I'm a, I'm a sinner. I know what goes on in my, my thinking. How in the world is that me? But you know what? That's who you are as a believer. You're righteous. You're an accepted son, inherit, inheriting son of God in that sense. And so this is a big deal. In fact, it's such a big deal that you know that the creation that we look around, um, you know, I was, well, I won't say that. Anyways, but the, the creation that, that we, we see out there is actually looking forward to that day too. That's what we're about to read in verse 19. I, this is incredible. Anybody ever seen a picture of Hawaii? I was like, oh, that's paradise. Wow, beautiful, right? Or maybe, maybe you're not into beaches. Maybe you're into like the Swiss Alps and you're like, oh man, I could take a train ride through there. It's just this beautiful creation. And it's great to observe creation. But do you know that creation is looking forward to your day? And that their release from bondage, creation's release from bondage. Did you know creation is in bondage right now because of the fall? And do you know that, that one day they're gonna be released from bondage? Guess what day? the day that you're revealed as a child of God. They're looking forward to that day. That's what we see in verse 19. Look at verse 19. For the earnest ex expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Any Seinfeld fans out there? Okay. Um, here's, what's, here's what's crazy. Our future glorification is such a big deal. Uh, let's, uh, let's not minimize this. Let's, like, let's soak into this for a second because this is exciting. This is such a big deal that the entire creation is looking forward to it. And you know what the implication is? Why are we this excited? Why are, why are we craning? We're going to see that the, these words mean craning on our neck, waiting eagerly, just, you know, on the edge of your seat kind of thing. It says that creation has a, an earnest expectation. It's a compound word in the Greek with this Greek preposition, apo, attached to intensify the word. The word itself means to be attentive or looking forward to, but when you throw that preposition on the front, it just intensifies that word greatly. And so the visual it provides is someone of, whose neck is stretched out and whose head is thrust forward. I mean, you, we might say they're, they're leaning forward in their seat, they're... They're engaged, you know, this is how creation is being personified. Looking forward to the day that you'll be glorified. That's what creation is looking forward to. You know, I, it, it, it reminds me, <laughs> a couple years ago, we, had, we pulled out our old wedding video. Anybody done that in a while, had a wedding video, pulled it out? That's really fun and kind of, uh, kind of embarrassing at the same time to watch. But, but it was really fun to watch. And I remember we pulled it out. It's probably been a couple years ago. And I, and I remember watching it. And, and it, it really takes you back to that day. It really takes you back to that day. And a lot of, a lot of the emotions came flooding in. And, 
And I remember just uh, as I was watching the wedding video and the, the camera guy was, was on me and my, my best man was, was my brother and then my groomsman. And, and so I'm sitting there and I'm just waiting for Carrie to come into the church. And, um, you know, I had heard about her wedding dress. I had, uh, you know, heard people talk for her friends. Oh, you're going to love her wedding dress. Oh, it's great. You know, and I loved her. So I didn't, I mean, I would love anything she was in. So I, you know, I'm sitting here and it was really funny to me and kind of embarrassing too, but I'm up here at the front and, and they're getting ready to play the song. And I'm like, I'm like this, <laughs> like just, un, uh, just like, I, like I was the only guy in the room, right? I wasn't, I didn't care if anybody saw me and I was craning my neck. And what was I craning my neck for? Well, the big reveal, my beautiful bride in her beautiful wedding dress. And I still remember that. <laughs> in fact, I remember getting choked up at the altar and be like, man, I got to get my act together before she gets down here, you know, because I'm going to be tearing up. But I I just remember seeing that video and I was like, you know, if I could have got on someone's shoulder, I probably would have got on someone's shoulder. That's the image we have with creation, craning its neck, looking forward, leaning forward in anticipation to that day when you will be revealed as a son of God, the son of the living God, the creation's eagerly expecting that. And then we see that not only that, but the creation is waiting expectantly. Uh, Not only are they looking forward to something, they're also eagerly waiting. Again, Paul uses a compound word to create emphasis. And and the visual provided uh, is not only looking forward to something, but waiting for the confirmation of that thing, expecting. You know, we might say, I'm on pins and needles here, waiting. You know, so this dog is a great illustration. If you've ever had a dog that that's lo- that loyal just sits and waits for you while you're gone, waiting for the day, the moment that you come back through the door. And this is how creation is personified. Isn't that something? I mean, go out and just observe creation. Wow, this is beautiful. And that creation's looking forward to your day, your day when you're revealed as who you are in Jesus Christ. And that's just something to get excited about. And if they're excited why shouldn't we be excited? Why shouldn't that be an occupation of our focus? And I think that's really the, the point here that Paul is bringing about. So what is creation craning its neck to see or earnestly expecting? We've said it a couple times, the revealing of the sons of God, the believer's glorification. Again, we see that in verse 19. What's interesting about the reveal, this word revealing just underscores the idea of removing a veil or covering. Now, if you're going to be revealed as a son of God, you know what that means? That means it's already there. <laughs> you are a son of God. You just, you just need the covers pulled off, right? And at the point that you get your glorified body, the covers are going to be pulled off. You know, anyone remember the, um, the story of Jesus? He takes three of his disciples up onto the mount. Uh, we, theologically or in your Bibles, it'll be called the transfiguration, you know, and that's exactly very similar to what happened. The, the, the cover was removed for a time, and they got to see Jesus for who he really was. And that's why when John gets to the book of Revelation and he sees Jesus Christ, it's a frightening figure. We're, we're not talking about uh, the, the, the man that grew up in, in Galilee anymore. We're talking about the, the, the God of the universe and his glory blazing through so bright and overwhelming that John falls down and worship him. And you know, at one day, a cover is going to be removed from you and, and who you are in Jesus Christ is going to be revealed and creation is looking forward to that day. It's going to be a blessed time because we will have our glorified bodies and it will finally match our inner man. The desires that you have to do right, this distraction to do wrong, the sin nature will be completely removed on that day. That's that final stage of our one salvation. It reminds me, uh, this last trip to San Antonio, uh, Cody and I braved out in the sub. Of course, the story gets better after I, it was sub-zero temperatures, had to be. I mean, it was freezing cold. It might have been in the 20s, actually, for a southern guy, but it was cold, and we braved out on New Year's Eve, and, and, and my father-in-law bought some fireworks, and we went out and lit those fireworks, and, and I remember there was one firework, and uh, we weren't going to buy it because it didn't have the shiny wrapper 
uh, around it. It just had this brown paper wrapping on it, maybe a little bit of the shiny wrapper. And I thought, yeah, it'll, it'll still work. And so we throw, that, we throw that thing in the little tube, and it goes up. And sure enough, when it gets into the air, I mean, it exploded. Like beautiful colors. But you should have seen the wrapping on that thing. It's like brown paper bag. Like, it looked awful, you know? And yet, when it got up into the air, you saw this, this thing of beauty. And, you know, this is going to be similar when we get our glorified bodies. When, when this brown paper bag of a body that we're wearing that creaks and aches and gets sick and all this, kind of, it, there's something inside of you, right? What does he say? What does Paul say in Corinthians? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You've got, you've got something inside of you that's going to be revealed at your glorification. And you know what? Creation is looking forward to that day, the revealing of the sons of God. And in terms of time frame, we don't have time to look at all these passages. Um, in fact, I'll probably just fly through this real quick. But the believer is going to receive their glorified body at the rapture. We see that in 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, I believe their revealing will be at the second coming uh, of Christ to establish his millennial kingdom. We see that in Revelation 19. Um, this is when creation will be delivered partly from its bondage because we see there's still going to be death in the millennial kingdom. Um, and then finally delivered fully uh, when the new heaven and new earth are brought in, Revelation 21 and 22. And so that just kind of provides a time frame. Now, we've said creation is looking forward to this. We've said creation is craning its neck. We say that, that creation wants to, to see the revealing of the sons of God. Um, but why? Why? There's a very practical reason. And verse 20 kind of begins to give us that reason. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now, it says that creation was subjected to futility. When did this happen? Well, as we trace our Bible history, it it happened at the fall uh, in Genesis chapter 3. The word subjected is is our Greek word, hupotasso. And those of you that are familiar with that word knows that that's the same word used uh, of wives submitting to their husbands or or even Christ submitting himself to the Father. The, The same word is used. It simply means to place under in an orderly fashion. And so when we go back to the verse, we see that the creation was placed under futility, placed, placed uh, under, um, we'll just define it here, vanity, worthlessness, or emptiness. This is why I cannot get a flower to grow or stay alive in my house. I am just not gifted that way. I need to hire Ken Nowling full-time to do those kind of things for me if I ever want to do that. But this is why it doesn't just happen naturally, right? These are why these things don't just happen naturally. Death, uh, decay, uh, breaking down. This is why you don't, uh, you, know, you, know, you don't take a bunch of, I, I wish I could fix my car this way. My, my car breaks. I just take it in the driveway. I just go buy a bunch of metal and gears and just throw it on the ground next to it and then come back the next day and it's fixed, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. In fact, if I leave it there too long, it's going to rust, it's going to decay, it's not going to be drivable at some point. It doesn't get better, it gets worse, right? And that's, we know that. We know that to be true. And so contrary to what many world religions teach and many false religions teach, there's nothing to worship in this creation. The sun, the moon, the stars, uh, you know, hear people say Mother Earth, Oh, Mother Earth, and this. We're not worshiping the creation. We're worshiping the creator. And in fact, if we want to get really technical, the creation is dependent to be released from its futility when we're revealed as the sons of God. So creation's looking forward to our day. We're not worshiping it and its glory. Now, we can appreciate creation because God created it and made it. And and I would encourage you to to do that. But in terms of this this idea of worship of the stars of the moon, it's just so, uh, it's been so twisted in that sense. Now, we know from Genesis that creation was originally placed under mankind, but at the fall, sin brought death into the world and then corrupted God's original and perfect creation. Again, this was not something that creation chose for itself. It was thrust upon it um, unwillingly. And we see that through the phrases used, not willingly, and also was subjected. And how was it subjected? 
man's choice. Man's choice to rebel against God, man's choice to sin, subjected uh, creation. But here's the thing. There, there was also an actor in placing creation under futility. And the verse tells us who it is. Um, let's look at it again, verse 20. But because of him who subjected it in hope. And so who placed creation under futility? Well, God did. God did. And, and so I think that, that begs the question, well, why, why did he do that? <laughs> what, was, what was his purpose? Why did he subject or place creation under futility in this way? What was he trying to accomplish? Well, I think one of the things that he's doing here is creation, just like the sons of God, has a future hope, has a, has a day, has an ultimate purpose for it. Um, and so what he's done, though, is, is God has shown us that creation is tied inextricably to the glorification of the believer. And it also shows that, that although creation is very important to the Lord, mankind is truly the apple of God's eye. It, he, mankind is the, is the occupation of God's thoughts. Now, why does he think about us? You know, there's lots of hymns written about that. Why does he con- condescend to even consider us? Um, you know, I don't have an answer to that question. It's one, of the, it's one of the glorious things about our God that he even cares about us. You know, that we're like little ants in, in that sense. So why does he even interact? But he does. He, he's gone through great pains to care for us, to provide for us. And, you know, the other thing that he's done is he's showing us, I believe, how committed he is to the believer's glorification because he's now based creation's recovery or restoration on the glorification of the believer. Again, to give you and I confidence and certainty that it's going to happen. It's, it's a, a done deal. It's going to happen. In fact, notice that next phrase in the, in the next verse, verse 21. He says, because. Uh, and so this gives us the reason uh, that I just shared. Because the creation itself also would be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. All right, we'll, we'll move quickly through this last section here. But notice that they're delivered from something. They're delivered into something else. Um, this word will be delivered uh, is, means to make free, to, to liberate from a certain power. It's, uh, it's in the indicative mood, so it gives a, a future guarantee or a promise. In other words, creation will be delivered. It, it's going to happen. There's going to be a day where creation is delivered from the bondage of corruption that it's in. And you know, this deliverance from and to, um, we see it's going to be liberated from the bondage of corruption. I think that's just a synonym for futility in verse 20. And what does that look like? Well, the bondage of corruption is something that we've already talked about. It's just the death, the, de- the decay, the, um, the corruption at all levels of society. People, uh, people's bodies decay. They, they die. Uh, property um, goes into shambles uh, if you don't take care of it. Different assets, um, animals, same thing happens. So we see this all throughout creation. But uh, God is saying, and, and uh, through Paul here, that, th- that creation is going to be delivered from that bondage of corruption uh, into something else, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Again, creation's liberty, as we see, is directly tied to the future liberty or glorification of the believer. And then we finalize uh, the passage this morning with verse 22. And he says in verse 22, For we know... For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And so we know a couple of things. And Paul personifies creation's longing for the believer's glorification um, using the the pain of childbirth, (laughs) the illustration of childbirth. And boy, do I feel unworthy to talk about what that feels like. Uh, I've only watched it from afar, you know, from a couple feet away. Um, But, you know... those of you who have been in a, in a birthing room, those of you who have given birth um, in this room, you, you were, you have a, you're going to have a really good concept of the principle that Paul is communicating here, and that is present suffering and pain, future joy. If I can just get through this, just give me an epidural or just squeeze my hand tighter. Or if I can just get through this, you know, put a wallet in my mouth, let me bite through it. I mean, 
something to, to get me through this. I know on the other side of this pain, we're going to hear that sound. <laughs> that sound that can keep you up at night. But uh, you like to hear it in the hospital room, don't you? And so you hear that sound and you know that there's the joy I was looking for. I can deal with this pain because I know what's coming out on the other side of this pain. And so he uses that as this illustration. He says that the whole creation groans with birth pangs. Uh, it just means to groan or sigh. And it's just a continual uh, experience of creation. And again, any, any woman in this room that's given birth understands what that means, what a groaning, a sighing, and looking forward means. And then the second thing we see is that the whole creation labors with birth pangs, um, just meaning to be in pain, uh, travail, uh, together. And so this too is also a continual and present experience of creation. And so you see as you, as you walk outside today and as you look at a tree, you can look at that tree differently for the first time and say, you are looking forward to the day that I'm going to be glorified. <laughs> you can, the next time you see a waterfall, you can say, yeah, you're beautiful, but you're looking forward to my day. And see, that's the confidence that we have because of the salvation that God has provided. And so next week, we're going to look at two more entities who are groaning and moaning um, for our future glorification. And then we're also going to look at a, a present ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so uh, join us again next week. And um, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for um, your word and just really the great encouragement uh, that was put before us this morning there um, as it relates to the certainty of our glorification, uh, as it relates to the certainty of our inheritance um, as sons. Uh, Lord, we just, uh, we cannot fathom the depths of your love. We cannot fathom the, the, uh, the depths of your grace. We, we really, Lord, we only get it seems glimpses of that from time to time, but Lord, it's our heart's desire to be, to be mentally challenged this week, uh, to view uh, our present sufferings in light of our future glorification. Uh, may that be a constant uh, thought in our minds and may, may it impact the way we, we live and view things presently. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.